engine, we have hundreds of thousands of microservices that a company has to manage. Hello there, and thank you for joining me on day one of 100 Days of Kubernetes, in which I learn each day something new about Kubernetes or related and share with you either in video format or on my blog. For those who are new to me, my name is Anais. I worked for the past three years in the blockchain space and just transitioned into the DevOps industry sector. And as you can imagine, there's a lot, a lot to learn from me. So I want to take you along on that journey in these 100 days. So just a quick reminder, I share all of my resources here on my public Notion page, uh, my DevOps diary, my DevOps related newsletter. So sign up to that if you're interested. Weekly newsletter about any free resources that I came across in the previous week. Also, here are all my resources on my 100 days of Kubernetes. So check that out. Here, we're going to dive in right into day one. So let's have a look at what Kubernetes is. Why do we need it? How does it work and its basic architecture? So we used to have, or many organizations still have, huge monolithic applications, meaning everything that the application needs, all of its features, all of its, or most of its dependencies are within this application. And as you can imagine, it's first of all, really difficult to deploy new features because let's say you want to inject something in here, a new feature, then you would have to make sure that this thing doesn't break that thing and that thing doesn't break this thing. And you are in this kind of loop of like, oh my God, what do I change first without breaking anything? Then next thing is it's really difficult to scale. So let's, let's say you have more and more users and they want to use the specific part of the application. Um, how do you make sure that this one can expand within the settings or whatever you have defined within your monolithic application. And the last thing is it's quite difficult to maintain these applications um, because you have so much code and legacy code, etc., that you have to take care of whenever you make any changes, um, that it's quite difficult to also make bug fix because maybe um, something that's perceived as a bug is actually a dependency of something else and so on. So it's really difficult to abstract the different layers of this application. So what we do instead is now we put different features, for instance, into little containers. And these might be Docker containers, these might be any other form of containers, uh, but they are generally defined through a Docker file. So we have a Docker file that's defining our Docker image, and then the Docker image can be run as a container. So we have those. So moving from monolithic to microservices. And let's imagine we have hundreds of thousands of microservices that a company has to manage. Obviously, they wouldn't want to do that with scripts. That would be uh, either quite difficult or just impossible to do. So for that, we have container orchestration systems such as Kubernetes. So one of the more popular container orchestration systems is Kubernetes. And let's take a look closer at the architecture of Kubernetes. Um, so let's imagine this is your Kubernetes cluster that might be running on AWS, it might be running on Google Cloud, it might be your local Kubernetes cluster that you run through mini cubes or micro cates. <laughs> Don't know how to pronounce that. And within that you have usually a main node or master node. Main. And then you have worker nodes. So you might have Oh, you might have two nodes, you might have three nodes, and each of those nodes, they run pods. So for example, you have here one application, and then you have here, for instance, maybe a backup or the same application. So you can scale it depending on the number of users that are currently using your application. Anyway, so you have here those pods, and these pods, they have to communicate with each other. They are running your containers. Um, and pods are basically an abstraction of those containers. So they don't actually run the containers itself inside of them, but they run this abstraction of what is your container supposed to be. And in order to be able to communicate with each other, they need IP addresses. And every time you spin up a pod, it will get assigned a, a new IP address. Um, the problem is now, if this pod goes dead, 
then we have to find a way to basically spin it up and tell all the other nodes, hey, that is a new IP address. It's the same node or like it's the same pod that has it's the same functionality. It just has a different um, name to call now, let's say. So in order to make it more effective, we have services that kind of wrap up around our pods. And the service is basically has two functionalities. So the first function is that it has to provide an IP address to our pod. And the second one is to provide a load balancer. Now more on load balancers later on. Um, so what you just have to remember is that we have services that basic in Kubernetes that um, are responsible to provide the IP address for our pod. So now that we looked at pod specifically, let's look at what the main node is supposed to do. So the main node has four different functionalities. First of all, it has an API server. And the API server allows you, for example, to communicate through the command line with your Kubernetes cluster. The second one is a controller manager. And the controller manager keeps track of the state within the cluster. Then we have a scheduler which basically ensures where does a pod have to be placed, where does a pod has to be arrived. And, and then lastly, we have the ETCD. And the ETCD keeps track of the state within our cluster. So it will basically realize any, to keep track of any state changes. So when a pod goes down, it changes in state. When it's revived, it changes in state. Um, and that's what the ETCD is for. Now, you usually tell Kubernetes how your cluster and the pods within the cluster have to look like through YAML syntax. And that's basically where a lot of the fear from Kubernetes comes from because people are like, oh, raw YAML, oh my God, how do I do that? So with that, you basically tell it, and we, I will look at that later on in some days, um, how, um, yeah, how your pods within the cluster are supposed to behave. And lastly, all of this is done in a declarative format, meaning we tell Kubernetes, this is what's supposed to happen, make it happen. Like that's our desired state. That's defined here in the YAML syntax. So that's our def desired state. Make sure that the cluster and the pods of it look like that. So if you, you can imagine similar to be if you are, uh, if you want to watch a cooking show on TV and you just want to you just want to do that. So you turn on this TV and you sip through the different channels until you find a cooking show that you like um, that is running at that time, etc. Right. So that's an imperative format. You uh, basically react to the state of your TV. So you turn it on. There's no cooking show. You change channel. There's no cooking show. You change channel until you find the desired state. And um, that's kind of um, reactive to what is happening. Instead, what a, a declarative way would be that you tell your TV every Saturday noon at 11 a.m. I want to watch my cooking show. Please turn on the TV and show me this cooking show that runs at that time, right? And that's then going to happen by your TV. Your TV is going to make it happen. And if the cooking show is not there, then it's gonna, it's gonna find an alternative. Basically the difference between imperative and declarative format. Now this is it for today. I hope it was useful. If it was, if you liked this video, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, if you would like to join along this journey and maybe discover future topics that I will be covering, then please do subscribe to this channel. Also, we have a DevOps learning group. So if you would like to join that, please reach out to me on Twitter. I hope you have a lovely day. Hope to see you next time. Bye bye.